Um, this is a potential <laughs> outcomes equation. <laughs> <laughs> what we have here is, oops. Um, this is the outcome. This is the, okay. it's, a, it's an equation about particulars. It's about the individual I. This is the outcome that Y has. Uh, it's a causal equation. The effect is on the left. The causes are on the right. Um, the treatment, we wonder whether the treatment is or is, or is not a, uh, a, a cause, a potential cause of the, uh, of the outcome. Um, and then there's a bunch of other stuff that uh, in, uh, acts uh, independently of the treatment. When you actually think about the treatment, I'm going to talk about this term here. But um, it's linear, but it's just linear between a whole bunch of stuff that works with the treatment and some other stuff. Uh, I mean, you can have much more complicated functional forms, but I mean, this is basically uh, the one that um, you don't lose much by doing this. Okay, so, um, and I hope that people have seen this before because it's a way, I mean, what justification does one have for doing randomized controlled trials? It usually, uh, half the literature goes through an equation like this, which I'll look at. Um, okay. So there's a Boolean version of this. Um, but if you think that your outcomes are too, your inputs and your outputs are too valued, uh, then you can talk about the, the way philosophers have talked for a long time. The effect happens if and only if um, one, this cause happens, or that cause happens, or that cause happens. Um, and that's what we see here. The effect happens if and only for I, if and only if um, one cause happens or another. But a cause itself is uh, a sum. I'm going to just look at that in a minute. Okay. Now, it <laughs> assumes that causes are what we philosophers call Inus conditions. I'm not going to tell you, if you don't know Inus, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it means. I just want to explain the idea um, that. Um, we often pick out something as the cause of a phenomenon. It was the <coughs> frayed wire that caused the fire, um, but frayed wires by themselves don't cause fires. So um, salient causes, the one you pick out and name, might be the treatment that you're focusing on. Treatments by themselves uh, don't cause outcomes. They need support factors. Or um, these are sometimes called moderator variables. I call them support factors. Other people call them, um, they're literally in the, in the potential outcomes equation. They're interactive factors statistically, but they're also, you can see they interact, they act. They, I think it's better to think of them as co-act, right? <laughs> uh, they all have to act together. Um, you know, if there's no, the example that uh, Sarah, I think Sarah gave, was Sarah yesterday, um, if there's striking the match, if there's no oxygen in the room, you know, get a fire. Um, and there are all sorts of treatments that um, need other factors to be in place in order for the treatment to work. Um, and all sorts mm -hmm. of exposures that also need other things to be in place in order for you to suffer. Okay. So um, the first thing is that, the, um, that all causes, generally, the cause you pick up, it's really, it, it has to operate in conjunction with a lot of other support factors in order to be able to um, either bring about the effect or make a contribution to the size of the effect. And these are charted, typically, in epidemiologist pies. So this is a very familiar notion. Okay. Um, and these, right there, um, those are the support factors. You see the treatment, and something else has to go on uh, 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 along with the treatment. Um, so I said this is particularly a uh, simple form, and then it could be um, a more complicated functional form of the interaction between the treatment and the factors. But th th those are the uh, those are the interactive factors there. Um, now, also, <laughs> there's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> so it, there are a few effects, effect kinds, that there's only one way to bring them about, or there's only one factor that contributes to their size, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, that the treatment may or may not be uh, contributed to the, uh, to the outcome we're interested in, um, but even if it does, there'll probably almost certainly be lots and lots of other things that, uh, that could contribute to that very same outcome as well. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what uh, saying causes or INIS conditions is meant to convey. 
Um, and it's a term from a ph the philosopher, Oxford philosopher, J.L. Mackey. Um, so philosophers are, uh, uh, it's come into um, literature from there. Now, randomized control trials. <laughs> Let's put this, these two things together. Um, the, um, they investigate one aspect of that potential outcome equation, or one aspect of one bit of the causal story. Okay? Uh, they investigate that beta. Um, and um, then they don't actually investigate the beta. Right? This is that's uh, the beta for a particular individual Y. What they do is they investigate the population average of it, and they do it for a specific population, the population enrolled in the trial. So I want to remember, just keep always in mind. Right? Uh, that study results are always about the things that are studied and not about something else. Okay? And going beyond the study population requires other knowledge, much other knowledge. Right? Um, there's nothing in, in the design of a study which looks at a particular population, nothing you can do in the design of a study to make that study result be about something that you didn't study. Um, it can be useful for learning about things you didn't study, but the use of it depends entirely on something that comes from outside the study. And having two or three or four right, doesn't help. That's like swan one is white, swan two is white. <laughs> so I've got two or three, why that, what does that tell me? Okay, so um, I think RCTs are general. They're general because they're about <coughs> populations, but they're not about populations, they're about a population. So they're not very general. <coughs> okay. um, so what are RCTs good for? Well, let's just <laughs> think back to that potential outcome equation and what that beta is. I said that what they do is they find out about the expectation of beta. Okay. Um, well, they find out a, they find out something. They don't find out about it. They make an estimate of it. I'm going to talk about that. So um, the beta i is the individual treatment effect. It's the value of the outcome that I would have if I were treated minus the value I would have if I were not treated. That's you know, how much effect does this treatment have on me? And that's B to I. Okay. So <coughs> then you suppose orthogonality. That means <coughs> uh, that in expectation, the, um, all the other causally relevant factors to the outcome are probabilistically independent of the treatment in the RCT. Suppose orthogonality. What well, it's just easy to show, that's a two-step little calculation, that the observable difference in means, so take the mean of y in the treatment group, the one you normally measure, right? The mean of y in the treatment group, the mean of y in the outcome group, the, that, uh, that's an observable difference in the study population study. Uh, if you've got this nice orthogonality condition, your randomization and your blinding and policing things afterwards, it really guaranteed that you've got probabilistic independence of all other causal factors from the, uh, from the treatment, then um, the, <coughs> this is true. The, the um, difference in the means in the, two, uh, in the two groups is an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect. So you've got the average treatment effect we're interested in, and now uh, you do this experiment once, and you have an unbiased estimate of the uh, average treatment effect. That is, you have an unbiased estimate of the mean treatment effects in the study population. Okay. Um, now, what fixes the value of that average treatment effect? I mean, what in the world? Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm now making an unbiased estimate of it, but what in the world fixes what the, what the number is? Um, well, it's a function. I mean, that you can just see that from the, uh, <laughs> the original algebra. Um, it's a function of the net effect of the support factors. The, the treatment effect for me depends on my, you know, what, what support factors I have <coughs> and lack, what the value of all those support factors are without <coughs> which the treatment couldn't have an effect. And of course, it might not have an effect for anybody. Nobody's got any support factors that could help. So that's all we're saying here is that beta <coughs> is um, the net effect of all of these support factors. <coughs> so
So that's what you're getting. I mean, you're getting, a, you're getting a, a, an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect. That is, you're getting an unbiased estimate of something that is determined by uh, the, ex expect the average of the support factors as they're distributed across the population. So, I'm oh, sorry, those are support factors. I had it public life didn't happen. So the eight in a population is determined by the distribution of the support factors in that population. Okay. Now, let's think a bit. I said we were going to get a unbiased, what you can show is an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect, which is determined by the distribution of the support factors in the population. Um, I will just want to focus on things, um, what an unbiased estimate is. I mean, we all, this is all stuff we know, uh, but it, when one's thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of certain kinds of evidence and what more you need to do, it's really easy to kind of optimistically forget. Uh, so um, I will talk about bias versus precision. Um, we get an unbiased expectation that means that the expectation of repeated randomizations on the study population. So if you took the same study population and you re-randomized and measured it again, and then you re-randomized and did it again, and you randomized and measured it again, and you kept track of the outcomes, you know, what was the difference between the treatment and control? What was the difference between the expectation and the treatment and control? You kept track of those, right? then in the long run, that average would converge on the correct average. That's what it is to be an unbiased estimate. So you're estimating it from what you see, but what you see, um, you'd have to do again and again, and it's like standard probability stuff, right? What you see, you'd have to do again and again and again and again, and then um, it would, um, the average of those um, averages uh, would be, uh, go to the right answer. So um, how many do you do? We only do one. Uh, usually, on the same population. You don't re-randomize and study the same population again and again and again, and particularly do it indefinitely often. Um, so it's a standard prob problem that we know about with, uh, with probabilities. Um, the point to remind us, just to keep in uh, mind, is that bias doesn't equal precision. Um, so if you had a perfectly conducted RCT, I mean, some, you know, the blinding worked uh, it was a real genuine random number generator that uh, <coughs> did the uh, assignment for you. No systematic differences after, um, uh, after randomization. So imagine you had a perfectly conducted RCTs. Um, then, as I said, you've got orthogonality, so it's unbiased for the eight, but it's not necessarily precise. So you're not, you, it could be, right, that, um, your estimates, I mean, here's the true answer, and your estimates are, in each case, pretty far off. Okay, pre precision has to do with how close to the, um, the true value um, the, the, es the particular estimate you've made is. So bias does not equal precision, um, and I want to think about what Ian Chalmers uh, correctly uh, uh, argues. Um, I mean, I've heard him give this talk, and you know, it's, it's kind of beautiful. It gives this history of people talking about comparing like with like. Okay, so he says for causal inference, you need to compare like with like. Okay, now that means you want to have the two groups, the treatment and control. This is all stuff you know. The treatment and control be alike with respect to the distribution of the other causal factors. Um, that's balance. Now precision. You know, how close you're getting to the real answer in this particular run of the experiment, the only one you've done, the only one you're going to do. Um, precision is about balance. And there's nothing about a randomized control trial, there's nothing about the procedures you do um, that automatically uh, provides balance or control for anything. Okay? Um, and what, you know, you think, well, yeah, but I'll do a standard error, I'll calculate the standard error, and then I'll know um, how far off I might be. You know, some bounds with some probability of how far off I'd be. But the point is that standard errors are um, much more difficult than one might think. Um, so we know that if you get bigger samples, you're likely to get better balance. Um, yes, 
That's true. But for many things, there are many, many, many causes. Um, and if J, that's the number of other causes um, in um, uh, support factors and others, um, if, if it's large, you can think, and I think this is the optimistic thought, and what I <laughs> seems to me it's what I see people assuming without saying so. Um, if it's large, and maybe they average out, kind of leaving balance. You know? um, after all, uh, I'm going to you know, be perfectly uh, exact about it. We don't need balance on each of the other causes. What we need is balance on the net effect of them. All right, so out, you know, think what all the other causes acting together are contributing, and you need balance on that both for the interactive factors and for the uh, linear factors. Great, thank you. Um, okay. Well, so, maybe uh, with bigger samples you're gonna get good enough balance, and I think that's what you're hoping for in um, medical trials. I, in my places where I've been studying mostly, you know, I do philosophy of the social sciences, not philosophy of medicine, um, and so I'm looking at social experiments, and with Angus Deaton, we do look at uh, development economics experiments, and they're, they're small, <laughs> and they have obviously zillions of contributions to the outcome, one would, would suspect. But then once you start thinking about genes, for instance, you, you guys have a, uh, many, many, you might have big experiments, but you've also got lots and lots and lots uh, because it's not just each cause one by one, but you have to look at the, all the combinations of all the other causes. Okay, so let's look at a case, just tell you one problem. Um, suppose there's only one important cause. It's unknown, unobservable, and unbalanced. Okay, uh, so we'll look at a simple case where, like that, uh, that's due to Angus Deaton that we talk about in this paper, uh, which is... Um, uh, you can find there. I'm sorry, I can't find the pointer. There, that paper. <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, if, if you're interested in it, we've revised it after um, a referee's comment, so I've got a shorter punches. <laughs> Instead of being 90 pages, it's 70 pages. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so here's the case. Um, he looks at a case where you've got a base population, um, he draws a um, hundred, he randomly samples the base population a uh, hundred um, for a, a trial study, a study sample of a hundred. He does that a hundred times. <laughs> then for each of the hundred study populations, he, um, he looks at, he randomizes into treatment and control and he does that a hundred times for each of the hundred study populations. Um, he assumes that the, when he does the, the, uh, uh, the Monte Carlo, he does that he, treatment effects over the individuals have mean zero, but they're distributed as a shifted log normal. So there's asymmetric treatment effects. So it's something he has in mind, something like a microfinance experiment, where most people to use Angus's words, twitter away the money. I would have been kinder. I mean, most people have other things to do with the money. Uh, uh, but there's maybe one or two really entrepreneurial, skilled people in the right position who make quite a lot of money. <coughs> so you've got a very skewed distribution. That's the kind of thing he has. Uh, um, there are other cases of Rand Health experiments, um, looking at uh, medical expenditures, and uh, there in, in, in those... Uh, original population, um, it was, I think this is not so untypical, um, there were a couple people who had huge expenses and most people, you know, had flu once in a while. So it's, so it's skewed, skewed distribution. Um, now, although the true rate is zero, you get significant effects way, way, way too often uh, in this. So if you've got a skewed distribution, um, you get significant Nothing, no effect whatsoever. You're still getting significant effects much more often than you'd expect, and you're likely to get one <laughs> in, the, in the single run you did, or there's a chance you'll get one. Um, and the problem uh, persists of quite large sample sizes, though it improves. Okay. Um, 
What's happening is the <coughs> outliers are a problem. Um, the estimate of the eight will depend on if you get the outlier in your study, and you know, there are outliers, so you might, got, you might have an outlier in your study. Um, if you have the outlier in your study, the estimate depends on whether it's in the treatment or control, obviously. I mean, it just dominates what happens. Um, so, more generally, skewed treatment effects are problematic, um, which actually is a, turns out to be a studied phenomenon in the Bader Savage uh, theorem. Okay. Uh, so, the point is that um, precision must be earned. Uh, unbiasedness is good, okay, um, but we would rather have the eight be closer to the truth, as in a small mean squared error. And that's the sum, the mean squared error is the sum of the variance and the squared bias. Right? Um, so we would like to be able to trade in some unbiasedness for a reduction in variance. So what RCT does is it gives you an unbiased estimate. Um, ideally, if you could figure out how to do it, you would be happy, I would be happy, I would prefer you <laughs> to trade uh, some unbiasedness uh, because we're not going to do the convergence in the long run business for uh, precision. Uh, so you can't prefer an RCT just because it's unbiased. Okay. Um, so what in the end, you've got this wonderful RCT, it's been very, very well done. What in the end do you learn? Okay. Um, well, as I said, you get an unbiased estimate of the answer, not the answer. Okay. And anyway, what's the question? Okay. Um, we estimate the eight in the study population, and that's just the average of the net effects of the support factors in the study population as they are distributed in the study population, which is very likely to vary across populations. So this has to do with the generality. Okay. So uh, one thing that's thought to improve on this because you've got a distribution of the support factors in the study population. Um, uh, study populations in kind of standard, I call them straight lace as opposed to blousy um, uh, in, this, in this work with Sarah. Um, I've tried to think what's, what's the contrast between a regular RCT and a pragmatic or effectiveness RCT and I call them well, one's very straight laced and the other's a bit blousy. Okay. So, but, uh, Pragmatic trials to the rescue, <coughs> um, because right, they're stri less straight-laced, um, and they might have more realistic distribution of the support factors. So, um, they're, because they're conducted in more realistic, realistic circumstances, and can have looser inclusion and exclusion conditions. Um, so we think, oh, the study population is more like target populations. Problem, really? How is it more like? In what ways? The eight in a population is a function of the distribution of the support factors there. That's how they should be alike. Right? So you, you have a new RCT in a new population uh, and, uh, and on the site in a real clinic with real clinicians and real patients with uh, real com comorbidities they have. Um, is it like your patient right? or is it like the next the population in the next clinic or the next village, um, the next county, um, is it the same in Scotland and in uh, England and Wales? Uh, okay. So um, we know exactly <laughs> uh, how they should be like. Not with respect to, I mean, they have to be with respect to all the support factors. Of course, now, pragmatic trials remind us that the support factors do include things like the skills and the amount of time of the clinician, um, the comorbidities of the, of the patient. So um, there are advantages of pragmatic trials. Agreed, you may pick up, you will pick up individuals that have a different range of values for the support factors than in a less inclusive trial. And you'll pick up individuals who are being treated by new doctors who haven't had much experience, by people who are very rushed, uh, but you might also be looking at ones who are uh, really much more experienced than the guys who were <laughs> in the trial, the original straight lace trial. Um, anyway, you see what I mean. You'll be, you will pick up law people, individuals in your trial sample who have uh, a different range of values for the support factors mm -hmm. than are less inclusive. So that's nice, but 
what you have to do if you think you're going to learn something from this about the next population, and you're not going to learn anything about your particular individual, because you're still only getting averages, but if you think you're going to learn something about the, uh, the next realistic population in the next clinic, is you have to hazard that the distribution in one realistic setting is likely to be more like that in another than is the distribution in a more restricted population. You might be willing to hazard that, but you also have to hazard that it's like enough. Right? Um, and what are you doing that on the basis of? Okay. Um, that hardly hazarding this hardly earns the tunnel of rigor that the big R cost of RCTs is supposed to buy in the first place. Okay. So when you're thinking about rigor, remember that a chain of argument is only as strong as its weakest link. So you know, do a really costly RCT pragmatic trial, um, unless you know you and you do it really, really well. Uh, and now you're going to hazard that this clinic's just like that clinic. I, I think I mean, that's to me that's really lacking in um, a, a, a kind of reasonable uh, allocation of resources um, to, to load all to load a lot of rigor on um, on, on one link uh, with. Uh, such a, uh, such other weak links. So, um, on the other hand, this is just what we do. Um, so maybe I'm just misunderstanding what people do, but I mean, here's a kind of standard remarks. Many users of trial information rely on published journal articles. <laughs> These articles generally do not reflect the exact definition of the study population. Okay, incomplete or inadequate reporting of eligibility criteria hampers a proper assessment of the applicability of the trial results. Well, I think that's really a mistaken thing to say. Um, so beware of our population descriptions. Our description of a population is not relevant to its eight. Right? How we describe the population isn't what fixes the eight. What matters is nature's description of the population. And that is, what matters is the distribution of the support factors there. Um, so, I mean, that's all I want to say is that you really have to have an argument, a good reason to think that the support factors are distributed the same in these two groups. Um, and you might have good reason to think they're not distributed the same between the straight lace trial and the pragmatic trial. It's, what are, it's making inferences from any of those to another population that worries me when you don't have a clue what the support factors are. Um, you, you use a bunch of markers that somehow seem uh, you've got good intuitions about. Um, uh, I mean, you might actually have knowledge, but that's not being, I don't think that's part of the evidence base that uh, is being uh, provided uh, up front and reviewed. So suppose your pragmatic trial population satisfies a description D. It may be long, um, you know, you describe your pragmatic trial population as best you can with the, you know, the just distribution of comorbidities, things you know, uh, things you think might matter. Okay. Um, what do you learn? Okay. Well, generally, the description you give, since you don't know what that potential outcome equation actually looks like, what the variables in it are, and your, your whole investigation is even to find out whether T is in it or not, let alone what the support factors are. Um, and if you did know the support factors, you should be controlling for them uh, stratifying on them to begin with. Um, generally, your description will include factors that are not in among the support factors and omit others. So what follows is imagine you get, imagine that you actually are dealing with um, a situation, a population in your, in your pragmatic trial where the true eight is greater than zero. The true eight <laughs> that you're trying to estimate. Um, what all that follows from uh, the fact that the true eight is bigger than zero in a population that satisfies description D is that at least someone satisfying D was helped and they're in the study population. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, depending on the size of the eight, you might be reasonably able to say 10 someones were helped or 20 someones were helped who satisfy description D, which is going to be a big disjunction. Um, so the true eight is greater than zero shows you that D does not ensure the treatment is ineffective which is not all that much to learn since, okay. Um, so we need to know much more, okay. Any further conclusions, though, depend entirely on other knowledge. And um, 
it says in this paper that I showed you, but not in the revised version. It's, it's a little uh, less assertive. A rigorously established result is, uh, use elsewhere is justified by a loose declaration of simile is no stronger than a number pulled out of the air. I think that's a little excessive, but I mean, it's okay. <laughs> now, return to the potential outcome equation. There's no way to get away from the need to learn what the support factors are, <laughs> the Ws. Both for new population predictions, you know, if you want to pr make a prediction from one population to another, well, you're not making it from one population, you want to make a prediction about a new population, you've got to know. Willy-nilly, you're betting on what the distribution of support factors is. So it sure would be worth your while, worth our while to invest. We do, okay, okay. and for the individual patient, that again, um, now, which you already knew. You didn't need me to stand here and talk for 30 minutes to tell you that. I think, you know, what I'm doing is teaching my <laughs> grandmother to suck eggs here. But I want, you know, I th this just, it's so important to keep this in mind given um, the kind of um, efforts I've, I see being made, um, you know, in the area particularly that I'm working in, in so social policy, where um, their efforts are going all into randomized control trials. Then you do a little subgroup analysis, but subgroup analysis is on the variables you happen to think might matter and their correlations. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a start on who works, <coughs> what works for whom, uh, but it's not, I mean, there are other ways to, to go about doing it that we're not making use of, so I want to close with that. Um, uh, so you also want not just to know what they are, but how they act in combination which I take it in medicine is really important. Uh, and you want to know the independent causes. I think you want to know the independent causes. Uh, if you're really, um, you might not if you want to know just your, uh, your uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the population health perspective. But if you're thinking about your individual patient, um, you know, there might be um, overwhelming factors um, that are affecting them and the treatment is not going to, it's going to be a drop in the bucket compared to that. Um, or they might be going to get better anyway <laughs> uh, and the treatment is uh, un unnecessary. The example I can use is not a, I mean, it's a kind of grim one of um, there's no point in refusing uh, salt in the food of the guy who's going to be, you know, it's his last meal before he's executed in the morning. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so now the point is that's what the other methods are good for. They're, they're not all of them good for everything, but we've got other methods. Econometric causal modeling, causal based nets, qualitative comparative analysis, process tracing theory. Uh, these investigate other aspects of the potential outcome equation, where they provide us methods to evaluate other aspects of it. Um, I'm going to look at, I'm just going to tell you about three. I'm not going to tell you anything serious about them. Just, I realize that sometimes medical people don't have any. Uh, sometimes don't know anything about them. So this is just familiarize you, then uh, go, um, you know, go look. So here's uh, QCA, qualitative comparative analysis. Remember this Boolean uh, <laughs> uh, version of the potential outcome equation, which just says, uh, you know, if you have, a, if you have a, a full set, you know, one of those epidemiologist pies, you get the effect. It's a, it, it's a two value thing, right? That the, the cause, a set of, a, a set of cause and helping factor is sufficient. Um, well, QCA um, is a kind of long manual way of constructing this Boolean equation from the data, which might be data on your actual population you're interested in. Again, it won't be data um, on your individual, even though there's an I in it. I mean, uh, you won't have all that kind of data on your individual, but you can get data on your population sometimes. So uh, here's qualitative comparative analysis a la my, our <laughs> Durham colleague, David Byrne. Um, and he, um, just to show you what it sometimes looks like, table three. Okay, there's table three. <laughs> okay. um, table three is very large, but easy to interpret since all that is required is to read across. The, the outcome we're interested in here is income. Okay. Um, all that's required is to read across uh, a row and see the percentage of cases with that configuration um, in each of the income bands. And the percentage of each income band coming from cases in that configuration. So you see you've got different incomes. You want to, there are different values of your Y. And you've listed everything 
right, that uh, contributes to that. So the whole available sample is fully described. So you see that's what we've got there. Okay. Um, Dave tells us lessons from the table. Uh, just to, you know, to give you some, um, if we take those cases who were aged 27 or less in 1992, we find interesting patterns. Um, mm. The, if you sort the configurations in descending order by the proportion of the top decile they comprise, you find the top three configurations are 34 cases female, couple, partner employed, higher qualification, service class, etc. 11 cases female, couple, partner employed, higher qualification, service class, not manager, top decile 92%, etc. Okay. So that's what you're doing in QCA. You, um, you're delving in detail into the data to construct um, the full functional form <coughs> of a Boolean <coughs> equation. Um, now, um, now, let's think about causal Bayes nets. Um, this is a causal Bayes net. It's a really, really, really simple one. It's only got one, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six nodes in it. Uh, they usually are a lot to have many, 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 many more. Uh, but that's uh, sort of what they look like. I use this one. Um, JPD is joint probability distribution. Um, and uh, I picked this one because it's got some medical stuff in it. Um, m most of them, uh, that I'm, well, as I said, I do social policy, so I'm, I'm mostly looking at ones that have social values. Causal base nets were uh, originally developed by groups around uh, Judea Pearl at the top and Clark Gleemore, the Judea Pearls and an engineer from um, UCLA, and Clark is a philosopher at Carnegie Mellon. Um, now there's lots and lots and lots of people, but I think they were the, their groups were the um, ins instigators of the causal base nets. Um, and, and what's important and exciting about a causal base net um, is that um, you, for input, you take, you've got a set of variables that uh, you're going to study, including the outcome you're interested in and the treatment you're interested in, um, and anything you can think of. This is like econometric modeling. <laughs> throw anything you can think of in. Um, so you put input causal and probabilistic information. So if you've got any causal, causal information, um, you know, what, what kind of thing you feel relatively comfortable uh, uh, about putting in as causal information about any of those variables, mm -hmm. you put that in and you put in probabilistic information, which are generally conditional probabilities or even partial conditional probabilities. Um, and the output from the uh, the algorithm is every acyclic causal graph that's consistent with that information. So of course, in order to do that, they have to make some assumptions about the connections between causes and probabilities. <coughs> the um, strong one is that a cause and its effect are always conditionally dependent, and that's sometimes not the case when you've got to, you know, when the same cause produces the effect in two different ways, it, they can cancel out. Uh, so, um, but um, that cause and its effect are always uh, dependent, and moreover, that the dependency disappears uh, when you, uh, if it's not a true, if you've got a causal dependency, and it's not a true causal dependency, um, it disappears, uh, it, that correlation will disappear if you condition on the uh, parents of the, uh, uh, of the cause. So um, it's, you have to make those assumptions about connections between causes and probability, but it turns out that they're strong enough to be really constraining, so that um, you, it, it narrows down what the set of graphs is like. If you put in enough information, you can narrow the set of graphs down fairly far. If you put in very little information, you don't get much out. Okay? So, and all this is provable. Okay? I mean, it's provable that if those three, uh, <laughs> the, the, the three axioms of connecting causes and probabilities are satisfied, then you, um, you never get a, a mistaken causal graph out. I mean, you always get, sorry, <laughs> you always get the true causal graph among the graphs that are produced. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the drawbacks to this is the causal graphs just have, actually, you know, those nodes in them, and you can't tell the ands from the ors. That is, you can't tell the helping factors, the ones that have to cooperate with T in order to bring it about, from the ones that are independently contributing. So, you know, it's, a, it's got strengths and weaknesses. Um, now, Let's think about process tracing. Uh, this is the last example I'm going to give, just absolutely for a second. Um, you can here's a very good place to read about process tracing. I'm going to tell you uh, 
because it's what I know about stuff I've been doing lately, um, it, which is in this paper here, um, which is, I think, coming out, it might be out somewhere else already. Um, and my idea is that to ground evidence for a causal connection between this, <coughs> I'm looking now at the individual. Um, so my idea was that um, you can, instead of doing a randomized controlled trial on a population, you could actually process trace um, across some of the, uh, the individuals in the population. Sometimes process tracing, it w you won't turn up anything. Right? But sometimes <coughs> process tracing can uh, turn up the right kinds of evidence to allow you to say, yes, in that individual, the treatment worked. That's all you're learning in an RCT. You're learning that in this study population, the treatment will work for some individuals. So I think it's exciting if you can do process tracing, and in particular, um, we're very keen on doing it in psycho, um, psycho talking therapies, uh, because they're kind of hard to RCT them. So if you could do this. Um, now, I think that, I mean, what I do in this paper is to, to argue that you can ground evidence for a causal connection between treatment and outcome in a specific situation with a specific individual using what I call a SCEM. And a SCEM is a situation-specific causal equation model. Um, what it is, is you, you've got the, 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 PO, the potential <coughs> outcome equation connecting the treatment and the outcome. Um, it just reiterates that for the cause, other causes of the outcome, the causes of the causes, and so many effects. Um, and then uh, many types of evidence that are commonly used for singular causal connections can be seen as testing aspects of the scam, including effect characteristics, symptoms of causality, presence of support factors, absence of derailers, presence of intermediaries, okay, like Bradford Hills. Okay. So you can see why these are symptoms of singular causation, because they're informing you about the, about the scam, which is de actually describing uh, nature's way of producing the outcomes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Drawbacks. Well, no causes in, no causes out. Or you have to make some bets on other causal, other you guys, and none of this do you get any um, QCA supposes uh, that you've got a way of controlling. Um, they, all they all need cause, causal information in at some point. Um, you input all the causal <coughs> knowledge to get new, but that's true of all methods. Different methods require different input knowledge, and RCTs require little serious substantive knowledge in, but they give little out. Okay. That's life. <laughs> now, uh, closing question, why is the medical community so opposed to this? I think much of it is. Why do I think that? Because uh, if you look in this <coughs> document that's been published very recently in the summer, uh, do you see any reference to causal base nets? No. QCA? No. Anything? Anything? No. <laughs> and this despite the fact that I was on the committee and kept talking about it. Okay. So, uh, in, to conclude, I think ignoring these other methods is daft <coughs> advice. Yeah, you're throwing good way, you're throwing in the rubbish bin good ways to learn what we need, but worse, given what we need to know for individual care, it's irresponsible. Thank you. <laughs>